All right, thanks, Dick. Yeah, sorry I'm late. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> all right, so I'm going to talk about um, the refresh condition for um, <clears throat> Congruence covers. Um, so, last time I was here at ICTP, I guess um, I remember standing in the lunch line with, with Alan Reed, and um, he was asking me whether uh, whether the Bianchi groups might might be virtually fibered, um, and whether the sort of techniques we had used to analyze um, the the, the LERF property for Bianchi groups might might be useful for that, and. Um, I guess out of that suggestion, um, I think a year or two later, I um, came up with this condition for three manifolds to be virtually fibered, and um, and that's um, then led to this uh, this this refresh condition that I'll explain. Um, and so now um, this semester we've been at the Institute for Advanced Study, and he asked me, well, um, can you essentially the question, can you can you do this? this um, Similar thing for congruence covers, at least of Bianchi groups, and so um, <clears throat> that's that's what I want to talk about today is um, sort of what progress I've made in that question. It's a little more specific question than that, so I'll, I'll get to the um, more details. So, um, so the plan for the talk is to um, first talk about the refresh condition and virtual fibering. And then, um, <clears throat> and talk about Bianchi groups. And then um, a little bit about, um, well, then, so, um, so I'll, I'll describe the Bianchi groups and then about congruent subgroups and the. <clears throat> And then about the, um, um, I guess, bass Serre theory. And how you can, how you can apply it to, to get certain um, Bianchi groups which, which have congruence covers that, that, are, that are fibered. Okay, so, um, so, the, um, so first about the, the refresh condition. Virtual fibering. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here we'll have M, uh, a compact manifold. The boundary. Um, <clears throat> Possibly closed, and all the characteristic equals zero. So all the boundary components, if they exist, are um, uh, tori. I guess I should say orientable too. <clears throat> and uh, and th um, three manifold. So um, <clears throat> so examples would be. Um, Non-split link complements, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to put a spherical here as well. So um, <clears throat> the universal cover is contractible or it's um, or it's uh, equivalent to, to a variety of other things like pi, pi two is, is zero and pi three is zero. Um, and um, and hyperbolic three manifolds. Okay, so then um, another way of constructing such things is via fibration. So um, I'll talk more about this, I guess, on Wednesday. Um, so M is fibered if. Um, There's a, um, a fiber bundle um, 
So we have a surface, compact surface vibration over, over the circle. Um, <clears throat> so um, equivalently, there's um, uh, <clears throat> it's a mapping torus. There's a um, self homeomorphism of surface with um, um, <clears throat> M is homeomorphic to the, the mapping torus of phi. So it's um, sigma times, we multiply it by an interval, and then we identify um, endpoints. And um, and we get a, a, a manifold now where um, the boundary components correspond to the boundary components of sigma um, crossed with zero when then the endpoints glued together. If it's all orientable, then those will all be will all be tori. So uh, <clears throat> so example would just be I guess the the product um, manifold and. Um, uh, figure eight knot complement. So if we um, take a regular neighborhood of the figure eight knot in the three sphere and um, take its complement, it's well known to be um, cipher, to, 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 to be fibered over the, over the circle. Um, so is the is the whitehead link, I guess. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> so this. Uh, fibers um, with a, a genus one, one's punctured surface fiber. Um, this fiber is actually in infinitely in many different ways, <clears throat> um, which it can do since its, its first bedding number is, <clears throat> is is two. All right, so um, so then M is virtually fibered if. Uh, Um, there's a fine sheet of cover. M tilde of M, such that M tilde fibers. <clears throat> um, can everyone see okay? All right, so... Um, <clears throat> So the goal then will be to, to discuss <clears throat> three manifolds that have a, a finite sheet of cover that fibers over the circle. Let's first look at a, a non-example just for comparison. So you have, um, we take a closed surface of Euler characteristic less than zero um, and then take the, the unit tangent bundle like a, a genus two surface, um, then uh, that's a three manifold. It's actually also a vibration over the, um, over the surface, but with, with the fibers are, are, are these circles. And um, this doesn't fiber and it has no fine sheet of cover that, that fibers either. So um, anyway, so, <clears throat> um, and this is this is also uh, satisfies the other conditions: orientable, aspherical. So that's that's an example of a of a, of a cyphered fibered space. Um, so, um, so Thurston's Thurston asks this question then. Um, are hyperbolic three manifolds? Virtually fibered, and um, so so I answered this question. Yes, is it's actually um, more general than that. It applies to many aspherical manifolds as long as you um, excludes um, 
certain cipher fibered spaces and some other, um, some other things analogous to that, certain graph manifolds. Um, but otherwise, by work of um, uh, Shizitsky and, and, and Wise and, and myself, then we know that um, most, um, <clears throat> most, most three manifolds, a circle three manifolds, are virtually fibered. If, if, they, if they admit a metric of non-positive curvature, it's a equivalent condition. Okay, so, um, but I want to talk about some very specific examples today. So let's talk about the reefers condition then that's used to prove this. Um, so a group <clears throat> G is um, residually finite rational solvable. Or, Um, or the, this is reefers for short, that if um, <clears throat> there exists a filtration of the group by subgroups of finite index, which um, are <clears throat> some sense of solvable filtration. So the, the, I guess I, won't, I wasn't going to explain the terminology really, but the, this comes sort of from the rational derived series, but I'll just describe it more directly. Um, so we have G naught, G1, et cetera, um, so that the intersection, um, intersection of GI is trivial, so it exhausts G and um, <clears throat> GI plus one is equal to the, the, um, the kernel of a map from um, GI that, so we map GI to Z and then we, um, then we map it to Z mod NZ. <clears throat> so it's a finite cyclic cover, uh, well, so the, so the corresponding three manifolds, I, I should say, um, MI then is equal to, um, uh, pi one MI is equal to, to GI gives us covering spaces. So MI plus one is a, is a finite cyclic cover of MI, but it's actually coming from sort of the, um, this factorization through Z means that it's, um, it's, it's coming from sort of the non-torsion part of homology. And that's where the term rational comes from, the rational derived series. <clears throat> So, um, so you have M, and um, there's some embedded two-sided orientable surface in there, which is non-separating. So that's um, responsible for some map of pi one M to um, maps to Z. Um, <clears throat> and then, we take, so then that maps to Z mod NZ. And um, that gives us a, a cyclic cover of N sheets. So um, we'll see, you know, no more copies of this um, surface here. <clears throat> and we've sort of unwrapped the manifold a, a little bit. Um, so that's, <clears throat> M sub one. And then we find some other surface inside of there. So I don't know, it's, it, it's usually um, going to be some different surface. And then we, we kind of unwrap around that. So we'll get a, you know, just schematically, I guess, we'll get a, another cover of that, which um, will have some number of less of this other, the dual to, to, to this, some other surface with um, like an N, <coughs> M1 fold cover. to give um, <clears throat> M2. Um, and then you, you kind of repeat that process. And you can, this, this condition of the intersections of these groups is trivial. If we choose a base point and lift it at each stage, then the injectivity radius there is, um, is getting arbitrarily large. I guess if we, um, if we had, I, maybe I should say um, injectivity radius if there's like a non-positively curved metric. So, um, 
the theremin <clears throat> to prove um, this virtual fibering. So what, it, what, what's happening here, I should also say, unless you started with something that's like the three-dimensional torus, product of three circles, if you did, if you did this in three torus case, each of these covers, the, um, the first bay number is always gonna be remaining one, you always get a torus, three torus cover. But um, in general, what'll happen is that the, each, when you pass the sequence of covers, the first bay number get, starts getting larger and larger, and you get more homology to work with. So the theorem is that if, um, Pi 1m, um, as above, with all those conditions, is um, reefers, then um, m virtually fibers. <clears throat> In fact, um, mi is fibered for some i. All right, so um, <clears throat> the proof of this um, makes use of um, sutured manifold theory. And I, uh, for sake of time, I didn't really want to go, go into it today. Um, but the, roughly the idea is that um, there's, a, um, there's a kind of um, obstruction to, to fibering. So if we, if we have a surface like so this is non-separating, it's not a fiber, then there's some, there's some non-product piece in here, um, <clears throat> part that, um, that's an obstruction to, to, to this complement from being um, a, a product. And um, the idea is that if you choose the, the surface right here, choose the cohomology class due to it correctly, then um, you can make it so this non-product region also uh, maps trivially <clears throat> through when you map any, when you map to Z. So there's, um, the, 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 the criterion is that the uh, cohomology class should be on a top dimensional face of the Thurston norm unit ball, if you know what that is, but then, um, then, that, then that will satisfy this property. And so that means that these non-product regions will, um, will kind of lift, these are called the the guts. Um, these will lift to um, <clears throat> to these covers, <clears throat> and um, what will happen? Um, so they'll keep lifting to a cover until um, you get to a cover where they become homologically non-trivial. So maybe it happens in this M1 cover, and then it turns out that um, your first bay number will increase, and when you pass to a a different cohomology class, you'll have cut up this guts in a non-trivial way, and there's a complexity that reduces, and you get um, a, a, a smaller um, <clears throat> collection of guts in some sense. Um, I think there's a variety of ways in which one could make that complexity precise. But um, so because of this cofinality of these groups, then. If I take any loop in the guts here, it'll, um, it, in one of these covers, it'll eventually be homologically non-trivial, and then um, you'll, um, you'll see that some sort of suture manifold decomposition has to happen, and um, these complexity has a property that the, it can only be a finite length. So um, at some point, at some stage, you'll get, you'll get a surface with trivial guts, which means that it's um, fibered over the circle. So that's sort of a brief outline of the, of the proof. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so now um, when I uh, first came up with this condition, um, I didn't really know of any examples of reefers groups except for like the free group and the free abelian groups and a few other examples. So the initial examples um, were like um, free and Free abelian groups. <clears throat> I guess I suppose here finally generated is really the the case that we're interested in, um, and free products and direct products. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, <clears throat> and then there's a there's a class of groups that are closed under these or start, start include these and enclose under these operations, so right angled Artin groups, uh, which I'm not really going to talk about today, but except to point out that they're um, <clears throat> Um, and then subgroups of, um, which is key here, so. So if I, if I take some subgroups of the Gs, then um, that'll correspond to some covering space here. And when I pass these cyclic covers, it'll induce cyclic covers of the corresponding covering space and um, of, of, the same, of the same kind of, of flavor. So, um, so that's, um, <clears throat> so if I can, so it, it, as far as I know, all, all the examples known, let's say, finally generated of reefers groups come from uh, subgroups of right-angled Artin groups. Um, so that's, that's essentially um, uh, the only way that we, that we really know how to, um, to, find, to find reefers, these, these reefers groups. So, um, So what I want to talk about today then is um, sort of a new method of, of, of proving this, um, this condition. And by happy coincidence, uh, when, when I discovered this um, condition around the same time, um, ha Haglund and Wise had found methods for producing lots of subgroups of right angle Artin groups, so-called special cube complexes. And so um, eventually we had um, lots of examples of these um, of these kind of three manifold groups that had that had reefers fundamental group. Okay, so um, so now I'll talk about Bianchi groups. Is there any questions so far? No, any subgroup, yeah. Because um, the property, <clears throat> if I take a subgroup and I intersect it with each of these GIs, then I get a sequence of uh, um, a filtration of subgroups which satisfy the same kind of property. Yep. Oh, just a, there's a sequence, and I should have said, yeah, sorry. Uh, in the case we'll consider today, actually, the NIs will all be the same number. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about uh, Bianchi groups now. So um, we have a quadratic imaginary field. Q adjoin the square root of D of, of um, <clears throat> minus D. Um, here D is a square free integer. So the square root is not <laughs> an integer. Then um, OD is the ring of integers. In um, Q squared minus D, so it's um, either equal to um, Z adjoin squared minus D, or um, Z adjoin one plus <clears throat> squared minus D over two. Um, if certain congruence conditions hold, and I can never remember what the condition is, so what I do is I multiply. I check to see when this is an algebraic integer. So I multiply it out, 1 plus square root of minus d um, times 1 minus square root of minus d over um, 4. Let's see, can anyone do the math there? Um, <clears throat> I can never think of my feet. So what do we get? Oh. 
All right, I guess I have to think of my feet. Okay, one minus minus d over four. So that's when um, d is <coughs> congruent to minus one mod four. All right. Okay, so um, okay, so we got this condition here, and then this is if d is <coughs> not congruent to minus one mod four. All right, so um, <clears throat> gamma d then I'll denote um, the group of two by two matrices with entries in um, in O d, and then we projectivize. So this is um, <clears throat> the space of plus or minus. So um, you can think of it as cosets of um, the center of, of PSL two uh, of SL two. A, B, C, D, determinant one, <clears throat> and um, the entries are in the, the, the um, ring of integers of um, O, D. So this always contains PSL2Z, which um, some of you know and love, and um, <clears throat> but it's usually, so this is of infinite index in, in these groups in general. Okay, so um, an example of subgroups, um, well, let me, sorry, I forgot to say, so, um, so gamma D is a discrete group of isometries of hyperbolic three space. Um, <clears throat> and so any, well, in general though, it has torsion because PSL2Z does, any matrix of trace zero, for example, um, will be ordered, will be an involution. <clears throat> but if I take a finite index torsion-free subgroup, then I get a, um, a non-compact um, hyperbolic manifold by quotienting H3 by that subgroup. And um, so, for example, um, of subgroups, pi 1 of the, of the figure 8 not complement is, um, is a subgroup of PSL2 of O3. <clears throat> okay, so um, a congruent subgroup. is uh, obtained by, um, it's basically a suburb of PSL2C, uh, let's say up to conjugacy, wide commensurability that contains um, a principal congruent subgroup of one of, uh, 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 of the Bianchi group. So um, we take an ideal in um, a ring of integers um, then the principal congruent subgroup will be um, the elements A, B, C, D, such that um, these are congruent to 1, 0, 0, 1, um, modulo the ideal. Um, <clears throat> so then gamma, um, let's say commensurable with Gamma D, so like commensurable, I mean, it's a subgroup of PSL2C that has intersection with gamma D is a fine index subgroup of gamma D, and, and gamma is also discrete. Um, it, um, is, this is congruence if it, <clears throat> if it contains one of these principal congruence subgroups. <clears throat> Okay, so um, the standard example 
of a congruent subgroup so that's not just a subgroup. So any subgroup of gamma D that contains one of these principal congruent subgroups will be, um, will be congruence. But um, if you take gamma 1, so that's PSL2 of Z adjoin I, then we take this element of PSL2C, and again, I'm abusing notation with not, um, not <clears throat> putting in plus or minus. This is in PGL2C. Um, then gamma, if we take alpha and we adjoin it to gamma, well, we get something indiscrete. But we, if we take um, <clears throat> alpha gamma 1, alpha inverse, um, intersected with gamma 1. This, you can check, is a fine index subgroup. It's a congruent subgroup of, PS, of, of this Bianchi group. Um, so this guy is, is congruence. And if we join an element to it, then we get something that's um, <clears throat> congruence as well. Um, but this guy here, since alpha is an involution it's trace zero and PGL2C, then um, alpha normalizes this group. So this is actually contains this guy with index two, it's a discrete group. And yet it doesn't lie inside of um, PSL2Z adjoin I. So um, it, um, and that's because here this doesn't have determinant one, so you have to take divide by the square root and you move outside of the, of the field of definition. Um, so in general, though, these, these guys will, be, um, will, will lie inside of the, um, the commensurator of gamma D. Um, so these will lie inside EGL 2 of Q adjoining the square root of minus D. So here we allow matrices of arbitrary determinant. <clears throat> and, um, and then we get the, the, the commensurator. So, the commensurator is the, um, the set of elements that when you, um, when you conjugate gamma D by them, the intersection with gamma D is finite index. <clears throat> okay, so now, um, <clears throat> oh, I should have said this contains, um, contains gamma 1 of the ideal generated, the principal ideal generated by 1 plus i. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, <clears throat> let's look so, at some other examples of um, principal congruence groups. So let P in OD be a prime ideal. Uh, like this ideal here, generated by 1 plus i. And um, n of p is the norm of the ideal, is you take the index uh, as a lattice. It'll be a lattice inside of OD, so it'll be um, some fine index lattice. You take the order of the quotient, or the index, um, if you like, and, um, and that this is the norm of p. And that will be some power of, of P where um, the norm, so um, where P divides um, the principal ideal generated by the, by the, the rational prime P. Um, then we get a, an infinite sequence of principal congruence subgroups by taking powers of this ideal. <clears throat> So um, <clears throat> we have gamma D contains gamma D of P, contains gamma D P squared, et cetera. This is a co-final sequence. <clears throat> Uh, 
And um, <clears throat> the claim is that um, gamma d of, of p to the i um, modulo gamma d of p to the i plus 1 is um, isomorphic to z mod pz the j for some for some j. Um, so we have a um, <clears throat> a sequence of well, you can see here that um, after the initial gamma d of p, these guys will all be fine index subgroups, abelian subgroups. So you could actually insert um, a few subgroups in in between. So that each of the um, quotients is um, is coming from a cyclic subgroup, so we could refine it to a um, to um, GI such that um, GI to, to GI plus one, or let's say mod GI plus one, is isomorphic to Z mod PZ. So um, <clears throat> the proof of this is um, essentially the binomial theorem, or at least the, the fact that every element in this quotient has order p. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so I'm using the same notation. So um, p divides, divides p. Um, okay, so, um, so gamma d of p to the i, again, it's really the sort of double cover sitting inside of SL2, but um, I'll just sort of use notation. So this is, cont this is contained in um, i plus m2 of p to the i is another way of writing it. So we take the identity matrix and then we add some um, matrix whose entries are all in the ideal p to the i. Um, so let's take 1 plus a, i plus a contained in here, and you take um, i plus a to the p will be, we expand that out, um, so we get i plus um, p times a plus p choose 2 times a squared up to um, a to the p. And we see that each of these is contained in um, p to the i plus 1. So their sum is as well. Um, and, um, and that means that i plus a has order p inside of the quotient group when we, when we quotient by um, gamma d of p to the i plus 1. Um, and then you also can just check that it's, the quotient group is commutative as well. Essentially, because when you take the commutator of two such matrices, the, the linear term will, will cancel out, like in, um, I guess, in, in, like in Lie theory. Okay, so, um, so that, that quotient then is a, is, is a free abelian P group. And so that now we can get to the actual question of. Uh, um, Baker and Reed. Um, when is um, is this sequence or some, I guess, refinement of it? And the nice thing here is that um, these are congruent subgroups, so you're getting um, congruent subgroups of um, of these Bianchi groups. If this holds, that that um, eventually fiber over the circle. Okay, so um, so the theorem then is that that holds um, under a very simple hypothesis. So um, so this. Um, holds if um, <clears throat> H1 of this principal congruent subgroup, 
I take H1 with integral coefficients, let's say, I guess I'll put the coefficients in there, um, has no p-torsion. So there's no, uh, no p-torsion homology of this, um, of this principal, principal congruent subgroup. Um, <clears throat> now, um, you, can, you, might, you might get the, the idea of uh, how this works here, that if gamma d of p has no p torsion, then that means that when we pass to this index p to the j subgroup, that um, it sort of has to be factoring through, um, there's some map here from the torsion free part, but there'll be some map from z to the j um, so that this is in the, the kernel of that map. And then, then this goes to z mod p to the j. And this will be the kernel of some such map. Does that make sense? Can it, sorry, can everyone see that? Um, so, so at least this, this first stage here will be um, a sort of first stage of a, of a reefer sequence. Is there any questions so far? I don't know um, how much number theory people know. But, um, anyways, um, so this now uh, gives many examples of um, <clears throat> of, um, of Bianchi groups that virtually fiber. which um, <clears throat> have a congruence cover the fibers. Namely, um, for um, gamma D, where D equals 1, 2, 3, 7, 5, 11, 15, 19, 23, 31, 47, 71. So, um, anyone recognize the sequence? <laughs> so, they, they, they proved that, uh, Baker and Reed proved that <clears throat> for these. Um, these, these are the only Bianchi groups which have um, these are the um, the only <clears throat> Bianchi groups with a prim principal congruence Um, link cover. So they enumerated these in, in some paper. And when you have a link complement, there's no torsion in first homology, so in particular, no p-torsion. And um, for some of these, there's a variety of different prime ideals you can choose there that give you uh, link cover. So I didn't, I'm not going to list out all of the ideals, but you can look it up in their paper. Okay, so... Um, Likely, it's, it seems likely that uh, this could hold true in much more generality. So we've used a very strong condition here to verify the no torsion. Um, but um, on the other hand, it seems like it might be hard to, to check this for, for infinitely many uh, Ds unless you have some kind of, of, general, of general theory. Um, <clears throat> I also asked uh, at IES, I asked, um, Richard Taylor, whether he thought this theorem might be interesting, and he didn't seem to think so. But anyways, <laughs> or didn't I mean he didn't see any application, maybe to number theory or whatever, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not really sure what the what the point is, I guess. Except that it's a natural question. Well, so I guess part of the point is that it gives a new way of constructing um, 
<clears throat> uh, reefers group. So that means that, um, that these, um, these link groups in particular are satisfy the, the reefers property. So we don't know in general. Uh, I should also add a caveat that it's possible that all these principal congruence covers they construct, they actually might be fibered. So, um, which I haven't attempted to check. I think some of these they don't even have link projections for, but in principle you could run some program and check it for all these. So this theorem might be extremely trivial, but um, in any case, um, this technique at least should hold, should hold a much greater generality. <clears throat> all right, so I'll sketch the proof, I guess. So I have, how much time now, like a few minutes? What's it? Oh, okay, thanks, sorry. Um, okay, so let's, let's look at it. <clears throat> um, so uh, this uses Bass-Serre theory. Um, A special case of a of an example of a of a, a Bura Toots building. Um, so let K be the um, all right. A Q of square root of minus d the p is the um, the p-adic completion. of um, <clears throat> with, with valuation um, V non Archimedean valuation V sub P associated to the, the prime ideal P. Um, so I'll I'll give a specific example of this in a sec if you're not familiar with it. In certain cases, uh, like for for the ones the Bianchi groups with plus number one, you can actually see these um, bass serre trees much more directly. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, so O V is the um, and K is the. Valuation ring and um, this actually will contain um, O sub D, the ring of integers, um, and then we can fix <coughs> pi and K with um, the valuation of pi equal to one, and then um, P will be contained in the um, ideal generated by by pi. This is an ideal in <coughs> OV. Um, and all ideals, when you, so the nice thing about passing to this completion is that um, it becomes, um, uh, well, all, all the ideals are, um, are of the form <coughs> p to the m for some, for some n. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at our example. Um, um, O1, we have Z adjoint I, the Gaussian integers. And then we can take pi in here. We'll take our, our ideal to be um, the one we had before, one plus I. And um, pi we can actually just take to be uh, one plus I since it's a principal ideal. And um, O1, um, sorry, OV modulo pi then will be isomorphic to Z mod 2Z. It's actually isomorphic to O1 mod um, 1 plus I in, in, inside of um, the ring of integers. So this, this sits inside the completion. So this is the, the p-adic integers inside of this number field with respect to this, this valuation. Um, so what's K? Um, 
Well, you can think of it as, it's a generalization of p-adic numbers, if you're familiar with that. Um, we can think of it as um, sort of formal expansions in um, our k is equal to the sum k equals k to infinity epsilon j. Oh, I should have said here that this is represented um, by the coset 0 and 1. So we get epsilon j 1 plus i to the j, <clears throat> where epsilon j is contained in the, um, so these are sort of like binary expansions, but we're going um, in the positive direction. Um, and then the valuation of some z in k <clears throat> is equal to um, the minimum of j such that epsilon j is not equal to zero. And here, um, k, is, k is an arbitrary integer. So th these can be sort of Laurent expansions, if you like. So this, so this contains uh, um, maybe not so obvious, but it contains the the number field um, u adjoin the square root of minus d. Um, so it's sort of clear, I think, that it contains um, O1. So k certainly contains O1, um, and then we can divide by um, uh, one over one plus. Um, 1 over 1 plus i, so we can take, so these will be precisely the, the sort of finite expansions here. Um, but in fact, you can, inside of this completion, you can invert any element that's co-prime with 1 plus i, and so you can get all the other elements of the number field sitting inside of there. So this is contained in, in k as well. Um, okay, so now the bass tree, is there any questions on this? Um, the vertices are <clears throat> OV lattices in K squared up to homothety. Maybe I shouldn't say lattice, I should say um, rank two modules. Um, um, and, um, or maybe I'll say, yeah, they're sort of commensurable with uh, OV squared. That's kind of what I mean by a, a lattice. Um, <clears throat> so up to, up to homothety. So up to multiplication by elements of k. <clears throat> well, excluding the zero element. Um, edges are, um, are such modules. So we have, um, say, lambda 1 will be adjacent to lambda 2 if um, <clears throat> Um, lambda 1 contains lambda 2, and <clears throat> lambda 1 mod lambda 2 is isomorphic to OV modulo, um, modulo pi. And then this is our, um, our finite residue field. So like in, this, in our example, this would be um, Z mod 2. <clears throat> um, OK, so then. Um, Note that this is uh, this looks might look asymmetric, but um, um, so um, <clears throat> but if we take um, lambda two, then it contains by this condition here, it'll contain pi times lambda one, and we'll have because it's rank two, the corresponding quotient lambda two mod pi lambda one will will satisfy the same condition. So that's why we take things up to homothetic so that it's um, this condition becomes symmetric. And so if we, um, so we can start with, um, <clears throat> O 
OV squared, and then this will um, be adjacent, so that will give us some um, vertex of the bass stair tree, and then we can um, sit inside of here. There's OV direct sum, pi OV, and there'll be um, pi OV direct sum, OV sitting inside of there. And these both clearly have this property that this, they're both contained inside of here, and this module of this will be um, isomorphic to OV mod pi. Um, there's a there's another one we can get. Um, we can get the span of OV1, say, um, minus 1 direct sum OV of pi comma pi. So um, see if I think if I, if I did chose that right, then that's, um, <clears throat> uh, anyways, that's, that's an example. So in, in, in the case of uh, our, our example at hand, these are the, the, the Bassier tree has degree three. In general, it's the degree of the residue field plus one, the, the projective line over that residue field. All right, so, um, <clears throat> so now GL, the claim, I guess, is that this is a tree. So in general, what we'll see here are the, the degree will be, um, will correspond to um, FQ P1, where FQ is the residue field. A finite field of some prime power. The claim is that this forms a tree. And Sarah has a, um, a, a beautiful book written about this called Trees, so you can, we can read all about it there. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, the nice thing about this tree is that um, <clears throat> DL2K acts on this tree. So um, GL2K, um, <clears throat> um, if I apply some linear map to one of these lattices, then I get a, a lattice or one of these modules that has, um, will, will be commensurable with um, OV squared. So um, um, that's, that's not that, that hard to check. And then it, it also preserves this sort of adjacency property of these, of these lattices. Um, in fact, adjacent lattices are represented by um, by Fricke involutions, so we can let epsilon be zero pi one zero <clears throat> times OV squared. Um, what do we get there? If I'm thinking of OV squared as like a, represented by column vectors, so this is an involution. So you get one of these three guys, which one is it? Cameron? Anyone? What's it? Second one, yeah, thanks. Okay, so pi acts on the second coordinate, so we get pi OV direct sum, and then one sends this first coordinate to the second coordinate, so we get OV. And then we take epsilon squared. Well, when you square this, it's an involution in the projective group, so you get pi, zero, zero, pi. You can just check that. I won't. Um, so we get pi OV direct sum pi OV. But this is equivalent up to homothety to OV squared. So that represents, so we have this involution that it cha changes these adjacent um, lattices, adjacent lattices here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, 
and that's called a Fricker involution, I think, or some generalization of a Fricker involution. All right, so, um, so I've got to finish up here. So now let me just um, explain how you get this condition. <clears throat> so let's let theta be um, SL2OV. Um, uh, and we take SL2 OV, and again, we should projectivize everything here, but um, intersected SL2 OV to the epsilon. This will be ABCD such that um, pi divides B. <clears throat> so in other words, the valuation of B is equal to one. <clears throat> So this is, uh, if we then intersect it with SL2OD, then we get a similar sort of thing here. So um, uh, if I take SL2Z of I, intersected SL2Z of I to the epsilon, then this will be the, the two by two matrices such that uh, B is congruent to zero mod one plus I. <coughs> Um, it turns out then if you intersect with all these adjacent guys conjugated by their corresponding Frick involutions, then you'll, the intersection of all those will give you the principal congruence subgroup when you induce it on gamma D. <clears throat> so we restrict to, um, but actually we're going to restrict to gamma of P, this hypothetical principal congruence subgroup that is, um, Torsion has no p-torsion in first homology, like these link complements of Baker and, and um, Reed. And um, <clears throat> this gamma of p um, my gamma of p um, intersected with gamma p epsilon is, um, is a billion p-group. And since by our hypothesis this is torsion free, then this will be, um, this will be sort of a reefer's subgroup. So now what you do is um, you sort of work your way outwards in the, in the, in the Basser tree. Um, GL2 k squared acts transitively on the vertices, you can check. Um, or actually, yeah, so GL2 of Q adjoined square root of minus D will as well. Um, so we start with our vertex and we put a we can take gamma p and then we can conjugate it um, to the various vertices of the tree. So here, epsilon, and then there'll be a gamma of p, the g1, gamma of p, g2, and then you work your way outwards. <clears throat> um, and gamma of p contains, um, gamma of p intersected with gamma of p to the epsilon and contains gamma of p <clears throat> intersected gamma of p to the epsilon intersected with gamma of p to the g1, et cetera. And the claim is that this is a, um, this is a reefer sequence. <clears throat> And so the point is that um, each of these edges are sort of conjugate to the, to the, the initial edge that we looked at, where um, this subgroup is a, is a P group. So each time we intersect with a new G1, so we do this in such a way that all the, the, we're always taking subtrees and we adjoin on one leaf at a time. So each time you adjoin a leaf, you're intersecting that group, this group, with the next one, which corresponds to an intersection of the two edge groups of that leaf, which is an abelian P subgroup factoring through Z. And so it induces a, um, a P subgroup, index subgroup, which is coming from non-torsion, non-P torsion homology, the infinite order homology. So that's sort of a, a, a summary of the proof. And I'll stop there, so I'm time. Thanks.